Hey, please be seated. Well, I want to welcome you to our last day of Synod, and i um, very thankful to God for His grace uh, yesterday, and uh, praying for the same today as well. Um, you're all still looking pretty awake, which is good, and I know some of you have a, a bit of a, an odyssey tonight, um, probably a few red eyes as well, I would imagine, going east. Um, Bishop John, could you come up for a second? And <clears throat> you are, you're flying right after you're speaking to us this morning, right? What, right. What, when are you going to get home? Uh, uh, I'll land in, about in Washington about midnight, get home about 1. Get home at 1. My goodness. Well, we're so thankful for you uh, coming. Um, and I want to pray for you in Thank a moment. You. When, you know, you're part of the uh, Diocese of Uganda, or you were at the very beginning. That's where you were I was ordained. consecrated, consecrated um, yeah. in Uganda uh, mm -hmm. to serve you, the churches in America that left the Episcopal Church went under the Church of Uganda. Mm -hmm. If I could share just one little sure. bit. Mm -hmm. um, when the um, Anglican Church in North America was formally launched by adopting the Constitution and Canons in uh, 2009, as it happened that same week, the House of Bishops of the Church of Uganda was meeting. And so we had arranged all of the transfer documents, and I was sending messages to them that the Anglican Church in North America has now officially launched the Constitution's approved. And within minutes, the Anglican Church of Uganda, which is the second largest province in the Anglican Communion, formally recognized us um, and transferred me to the Anglican Church of North America and then 150 clergy and 50 churches. So if you've wondered why we're not a perfect church, it's because I'm the first sinner in. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. I didn't know that. I am. <laughs> um, did, have you ever preached in Uganda? Uh, many times. So when you're a visiting preacher, uh, what's the first thing that happens in the sermon? Uh, you give your testimony. All right. Well, I'd like to hear your testimony. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was blessed to grow up in a Christian household with uh, parents who, uh, in their best they could, followed the Lord Jesus. And I gave my life to Christ when I was a very small boy. I knew from the earliest days that I belonged to Jesus. It was just a given in my life. Um, sadly, I was not discipled. Uh, the church I grew up in was not a Bible teaching church. Uh, this was the 19, late 50s, 60s in the Episcopal Church where everything but the Bible was, was taught to children. And um, so my, my, my faith didn't mature and grow as, as it should but I knew I belonged to Jesus. And so if you asked me as a boy, even in middle school and high school, what are you gonna be when you grow up? My answer was, I wanna be what Jesus wants me to be. I don't know what that is, but I wanna be what Jesus wants me to be. And it took me quite a while to figure out that he was calling me to ordain ministry. I was actually living in Africa for a time when God got through my thick skull that he was calling me to ordain ministry. But um, I learned so much from my parents. My father was the activist outwardly as a layman involved in the, in the city, caring for the poor, uh, deeply involved, his, put his faith into practice. My mother was very much the private person and the inward journey. And I remember struggling one time with homework. I was a very good student, but I was given a book that I couldn't grasp. And um, I was crying over my homework. And my mother came in and she had no idea how to understand this book but she taught me to pray it through. And so I'm very deeply grateful for the formation that they gave me. Now, um, I wanna pray for you in your ministry and, and I wanna know if there's something that I can pray for you on behalf of our diocese for you and what you're doing. I know that you're probably as active, if not more, in your retirement. And I also know you're living uh, right near the political center of the United States, which is so polarized right now. And we're, we're starting to feel that in Canada as well. How can we pray for you uh, and for the church in this? Well, I, I, I'd appreciate your prayers. I continue to serve Archbishop Beach as his Dean of Provincial Affairs and trying to help things um, run smoothly in the, in the church. And in the contentious and polarized world in which we find ourselves, that can be a real challenge. It's, it's a daily job. I've been on the phone and on Zoom for about three hours already this morning, uh -huh. um, dealing with misconduct issues and things like that. So I very much appreciate your prayer for wisdom. Well, let's pray right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the faithful witness of Bishop John uh, right from the very beginning of this province that we're part of. Uh, thank you for his deep love for you and for your church. 
And Father, we do pray, Father, for protection uh, for Bishop John in this work of um, dealing with difficult issues, of dealing with a polarized society and sin that is with that, uh, and that you would use him for this great work of reconciliation, of drawing people back into the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, of healing uh, churches. Uh, so, Father, we pray that you will lead him and guide him and give him the gifts of your Holy Spirit that he can be faithful in this. May he work in the power of our risen Lord Jesus as you fill him with your Holy Spirit. Uh, and may be, he be an, an instrument of your grace and your healing uh, in this work that he is doing. Encourage him, strengthen him, and renew him in this work and give him a very good flight and trip back tonight. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Well, more than 40 years ago, I heard the great Anglican theologian and evangelist Michael Green speak about biblical motives for sharing Christ. What do, what do the scriptures tell us? Um, how, how are we directed to evangelize? Or more pointedly this morning, why are we told to evangelize? Well, I suspect quite a number of you knew Michael Green and might understand that his address ignited in me a new passion for the proclamation of the gospel. It changed me and it changed my ministry. And over the years, in my own reading of scripture, I've tried to build on what Michael Green taught me that day. And so now I have nine biblical reasons to share your faith in Jesus. The Great Commission of Matthew 28 is, of course, the first and foremost reason to share Christ. Jesus told us to go and make disciples of all nations. And if for no other reason than Jesus said to do it, do it. But the Bible has much more to teach us about this, so here we go. Why share our faith in Jesus Christ? Number two, the Great Commission is number one, but here's number two. We should share Jesus because of the need of others. Matthew 9, beginning at verse 36. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. In one of my favorite descriptions of the human condition, Ernest Hemingway recounts the story of a father and his teenage son who had a relationship that had become strained to the breaking point until one day the son ran away from home. His father began a journey in search of his estranged son. And finally, in Madrid, in a last desperate effort to find him, the father put an ad in the newspaper. The ad read, Dear Paco, meet me in front of the newspaper office at noon. All is forgiven. I love you, your father. The next day at noon, in front of the newspaper office, 800 guys named Paco showed up. <laughs> the brokenness around us is so great. A North African has said that the most grievous crime in the desert is to know where to find water and not to tell another person. And for a Christian, it's the greatest selfishness to know where to find the living water of God's grace and mercy and love and not to tell another. We must tell of the forgiveness and healing we are finding in Jesus because the need is so great. Number three, we should share Jesus with others because of our love for them. 1 Thessalonians 2.8, we loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well because you had become so dear to us. The New Testament word for Deep and abiding Christian fellowship is koinonia. But all too many churches suffer from a disease missiologists call koinonitis, which is inflammation of the fellowship. 
koinonitis has flared up when we love each other in the church but don't seem to live out much love for the lost. We love our brothers and sisters in Christ, but we're also to love those who are not yet part of the family so that they can be drawn in and have a relationship with Jesus and with us. Too often the church engages in what I've come to call Edison evangelism, which is based on a wonderful story about Thomas Edison, the great inventor. A man came to visit Thomas Edison at his home, and when he arrived, he encountered a set of large gates uh, that he had to open to get into Edison's property. He had to push and push and push. Finally, he got the gates open. And while he and Edison were having their conversation, he decided to mention it. And he said, you know, Edison, for being such a hotshot inventor, you'd think you'd know to oil the gates uh, at your property. It's murder to get into your yard. Well, Edison lit up and said, oh, you don't understand. Let me show you. And he took him out to the gates, and there behind the bushes was an enormous set of wheels and gears and levers and pulleys. And Edison said, you see, everyone who comes into my yard pumps a gallon of water to a tank on the roof of my house. <laughs> well, when a congregation is just getting going, or struggling to survive, or when we've got a building project underway, it is all too tempting to see visitors as people to boost our numbers, a potential pledging unit, more kids to build up the youth group. But if we're trying to reach people for our own institutional ends, it isn't evangelism, it's manipulation. God isn't interested in it, and the people we're trying to reach will detect it and flee from it. We share Jesus with others not out of self-interest, but because of our love for them. Number four, we should share Jesus with others because of the sheer joy of telling them. 1 John 1, beginning at verse 2, we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Our experience of Jesus should bubble up out of us. The one time Archbishop of Canterbury, George Carey, swears that in a church near Cambridge, there is a plaque which reads, this plaque is erected to commemorate the Reverend so-and-so rector who ministered faithfully for 30 years in this parish without the slightest trace of enthusiasm. <laughs> no, <laughs> our joy should be contagious, and sharing Jesus with others should give us even more joy. If you've ever had the privilege of leading someone to Christ, you know the incomparable blessing that that is. We share Jesus for the sheer joy of it. Number five. We share Jesus with others because of the love of Christ in us. 2 Corinthians 5.14 for, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all. Christ's love sends us out even to those who seem far from the kingdom, who are uninterested or even hostile to the things of God. The church I served uh, as rector was about 25 miles outside Washington, D.C., and many of our parishioners had very long commutes to work. Using an early version of the HOV carpool lanes, some parishioners traveled to work in 15 passenger vans. And so we used to urge them to take advantage of the many hours each week locked in with their co workers and engage in some van pool evangelism. Well, one Sunday morning, a, a man I knew well came to me at coffee hour and said, I have a confession to make. Well, he didn't normally talk that way, so I was intrigued. He said, you know how we talk about sharing our faith in the, in the van pool? Well, I don't have that kind of van. We do not talk about things like that, and those guys are not interested, and I have never talked to them about my faith while riding in the van. And then he said, 
but there's a guy here at church this morning from my van pool, and I had nothing to do with it. Who do you know in your life who seems so far from God you're tempted to dismiss them? To say there's not much point in sharing Christ with them, they're not interested. There's probably not even much point in praying for them anymore. But everybody's just one step from the kingdom of God. Some of you may recall how the liberal Episcopal Church Bishop Jack Spong said in 1998, just before the Lambeth Conference of Bishops, that he wasn't going to be dictated to by the African bishops since African Anglicans were superstitious. And as he said, barely one step removed from animism, meaning the worship of spirits and trees and rocks and such. Incredibly offensive. But Archbishop Colini of Rwanda famously replied, let's see, animism, Jesus. How many steps does it take? We call that conversion. <laughs> I don't know about you, but when I've been a jerk and God is just about to break through and move me to repentance, I don't look like I'm about to repent. I look and am just as angry or as unforgiving as ever. But then God does his wondrous work and in a moment moves me to turn back. Don't ever write someone off as uninterested in the things of God. Don't decide for someone else that they don't want to hear about Christ so I don't need to waste my time telling them. Pour out your heart from there for them in prayer and the Lord will bring us to see and love them as he does. We share Jesus not from a place of smugness or superiority, but from a place of profound humility. We are broken people touched by the undeserved grace of God, and we share Jesus because his love compels us. Number six, we should share Jesus with others because God is depending on us. 2 Corinthians 5, 19 and 20. God is entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. It grieves me when I encounter Christians who are more concerned about whether their pet will be in heaven than whether their neighbor will be. God has no plan B for spreading the good news. You and I are it. We think Surely God isn't depending on me to tell my neighbor, my co-worker, my friend. Ah, but he is. Number seven, we should share Jesus with others because it is impossible to be quiet. Acts 4, beginning at verse 18. So they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Peter and John replied, judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God, for we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. A Mercedes-Benz commercial some years back showed their car colliding with a concrete wall during a safety test. Someone asked the company spokesman why they don't enforce their patent on the Mercedes-Benz energy-absorbing car body. A design which apparently was being copied by other companies. And the Mercedes-Benz spokesman replies matter-of-factly, because some things in life are too important not to share. Number eight, we should share Jesus with others because it helps us grow in our knowledge of Christ. Philemon verse six, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Failing to tell others will stunt your spiritual growth. You will not come into maturity and the full knowledge of Christ if you're not actively sharing Jesus with those you know. And last, number nine, we should share Jesus because so much is at stake. Acts 26, 17 and 18. Jesus said, I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, 
that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. A Boy Scout was hiking in the woods, and he wandered off the trail. And he stopped, looked around, and he said, I am trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, reverent, and lost. <laughs> I know lots of people who are all of those things. They are hardworking and honorable and successful and lost. Albert Einstein, the great physicist, was once traveling on a train from Princeton when the conductor came down the aisle punching tickets of each passenger. When he came to Einstein, Einstein reached into his pocket to get his ticket, but he couldn't find it. So then he reached in his other pockets, and it wasn't there. So he kept looking. He looked in his briefcase, but couldn't find it. He looked at the, on the seat next to him. Finally, the conductor said, Dr. Einstein, I know who you are. We all know who you are. I'm sure you bought a ticket. Don't worry about it. Einstein nodded appreciatively. The conductor continued down the aisle, punching tickets. As he was ready to move into the next car, he turned around and saw the great physicist now on his hands and knees, crawling under the seat, obviously still looking for his ticket. The conductor rushed back and said, Dr. Einstein, Dr. Einstein, don't worry. You don't need a ticket. I'm sure you bought one. I know who you are. Einstein looked at him and said, young man, I too know who I am. What I do not know is where I am going. <laughs> We share Jesus with a world that does not know where it is going. We share Jesus because coming to know him means life for all eternity. It means you do know where you're going. By his death on the cross, Jesus has taken upon himself the sin of the world, and he offers forgiveness to all who put their trust in him. He transfers us from the kingdom of darkness into his marvelous light and gives us that blessed assurance of eternal life with him. We share Jesus because so much is at stake. I had a friend who always said that he was so embarrassed to talk about Jesus he couldn't lead a silent prayer. <laughs> and I have to admit that there was a time when that was true of me too. The first time somebody told me he wanted to give his life to Christ, I had no idea what to do. Nothing in my liberal seminary training had prepared me for such an event. But God has changed me. I've led people to Jesus on airplanes. I've led people to Jesus at McDonald's. I've led people to Jesus through a long process of sharing our lives. And I'm not gifted as an evangelist. My point is this. God can change me. He can change you too. Just because we haven't shared Jesus in the past or haven't done it effectively doesn't mean the Lord can't use us powerfully now. Hear this. Our past disobedience is no defense against the call of God. Our past incompetence is no defense against the call of God. He calls us to share the word of God, to share our lives, share what we've experienced out of Jesus' great love, out of compassion, and joy, and obedience, and love. Let's share Jesus with a world that needs him so very much.